All right, our speaker today, uh, this morning, uh, before our panel discussion, uh, which will come after that, he is a retired lawyer. He was the Assistant Attorney General for the American Samoa Territory and former State's Attorney for v Vermont. He served on active duty in the United States Air Force from 1973 through 79. In 77, he and a co-worker were abducted from an Arkansas State Park while remote camping. In 2012, he retired, and in October 2012, a routine x-ray discovered two anomalous objects uh, deep inside his right knee. Retired from civil service and free to speak openly and write about his experiences, he published Incident at Devil's Den, A True Story on Amazon in 2018 and Devil's Den, The Reckoning in 2020. So he speaks candidly about his UFO, at UFO conferences about his experiences and we are glad to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Terry Lovelace. Thank you, Forrest. I appreciate that kind introduction. Good morning. How's everybody doing? It is my pleasure to be here. This is actually the first time I've been in Arkansas since 1977. So, it's fun. I understand we're about an hour from Devil's Den State Park. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I have a confession to make, and that is that today I don't have a PowerPoint presentation to show you. And I don't have stock footage of UFOs or anything like that. So, uh, but what I am going to do is I am going to promise you to tell you my story uh, candidly and honestly, without embellishment. and. I, I wish I could offer more by way of explanation as far as what these things are or what's going on, but I am, uh, I am as clueless as everyone else in that regard. I mean, I can make assumptions, um, but you all have a, a mental image in your mind of what they are and maybe you draw your own conclusions, so uh, I'll, just, I'll just tell you my story. My story begins when, actually, back to age four, but from the ages of five to seven, I, I used to have these little, and I know this sounds crazy, these little, like, circus monkeys visit me in my room, appear in my room. And at first, I thought they were kind of cool. I thought they were kind of comical, you know, uh, two and a half feet tall, and they looked just like circus monkeys. And I saw them as benign. I, di I didn't see them as threatening in any way. And since I published my book in 2018, I put an email address in the back of the book, and I said, look, if you've had an experience, please write to me, and I promise I'll write back and share your experience. And since 2018, I've had over 4,200 emails from people. But what's interesting is I'm kind of a data guy. I like to keep... Uh, you know, a spreadsheet on what people experienced. And I found that people between the ages of four and about eight, eight is stretching it, between four and eight, uh, commonly see, seems pretty common because I got a lot of emails, they see owls, deer, Disney characters, orbs of light, uh, all manner of things. And, and I think whatever we're dealing with here, is savvy enough to know how to appear to the child in a way the child will find most benign. So that's, that's what I think is their program. Um, and I remember that they would ask me to go with them. The one, there were four of them. They always came in a group of four. The one nearest the head of my bed would always hold out this monkey paw and telepathically tell me, Terry, won't you come with us and play? And we'll bring you back. And one of my nightmares for the past, what, 47 years or something, has been, I'm back at age six or so. I'm in my bed in my old house in St. Louis, Missouri, 
and the monkeys come, and the one closest to my head says, Terry, won't you come with us? We'll, we'll bring you back. And it held out this paw, but in my dream, my nightmare, it's not a paw. It's four long, ugly, gray fingers. And I just, I just flip out. Uh, and I still had that dream about once a year. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you um, a poem that I wrote. I'm not a poet, but this kind of sums up my experience with the monkey men. Uh, that's what I called them. You know, when we're children, we assign names to, to things, and I chose to call these things the monkey men. Uh, so I didn't know any better. This is called Four Grinning Monkeys. Shadows from the hallway crept into my room. Long the monkey men, too, I assume. Never before in life had I seen a creature that grinned before I could scream. A candle's flame dances before it grows dim. One monkey man's shadow has slowly crept in on his knees and with ease and is perched on the edge of my bed, if you please. The silence is broken one inch from my ear as the monkey man whispered, my boy, I'm right here. Now monkeys were four and were masked to deceive children or even grown men, if you please. I started to tremble and covered my head, but monkeys all four crept close to my bed. Outside of my covers, four peeled with the light. These monkey men here, will they take me this night? Faces with grins approached me to say, Terry, won't you come with us and play? Come with us now, give us your hand, and we'll take you to an unbelievable land. You may not remember the last time or when, but come with us now and you'll see it again. But I said, I know you are not what you seem. And if you are real, then why can't I scream? This night the monkey men take me with ease, and I'm but a terrified child, if you please. These things are not men that are born on this earth. Near a star to the west is the place of their birth. It matters not what I do or say. Tonight, like others, they'll take me away. Where shall we go? How long must I stay? Tell me, you four. Tell me now, I do pray. We're going home, Terry. There's no reason for gloom. See that star over there, just east of your moon? We traverse great distance, pick you up, and we're gone to return you to bed before breaks the dawn. We must take from you blood and things we do need. Many entities one day may be born of your seed. When I'm taken away, can my mom hear my calls across all of space, through brick and through walls? Will she think that I'm lost or been seized from my bed? Will she worry I suffer or fear I am dead? She'll cry and sob while we go and play if I don't return before dawn breaks the day. And when I return, will I come back whole or will sinister deeds take some terrible toll? We'll soon arrive at the place we do dwell. You'll see it is neither heaven nor hell. A place with two suns lights our day. A place that is different, but also the same. The years have passed quickly as life slips from my grasp. Pray, tell me, why did you hurt me, I ask. From earth you take away women and men and tag us and track us. Toward what an end. We are sentient beings that feel self-aware, but you are just monkeys, and monkeys don't care. As a child, I had no voice to say what may come to pass on some future day. I have the need and right to know what was done to me so many years ago. Surely you knew that one day I'd be grown, no longer helpless, no longer alone. Did you not believe that I'd live to confess the memories you stole and failed to suppress. So flawed was your sinister plan ill-conceived that others first scoffed, but then come to believe. I swear by all that is holy and all that is right, the next time you come to take me at night, when four little monkeys crouch near my bed, I'll take my revolver and shoot them all dead. (laughs) 
So it has a happy ending. So that's an introduction to the monkey men. And I had these terrible screaming nightmares when I was a kid. Uh, whenever they were come, I thought they were, or I thought they were coming, and I had no idea where they took me. Uh, but I knew that I, they took me somewhere, that I was gone. My, uh, I have a sister who's uh, 78 years old now, uh, still in St. Louis, and I, when I published this book, I gave her a copy, and I asked her, you know, what do you remember? And she said, I remember there were the nights when we couldn't find you in the house, uh, and the lights would come through the window. So, but that's all, you know. I think people that have experiences like this are reluctant. For some reason, they're, they're reticent to talk about it. Uh, not only because of, you know, people doubting you and, and scoffing and trying to make you to be a fool, but um, I, th I think that there's a level of influence that these things have over us. And I think one of those things includes suppressing our uh, desire to share this story. It was really hard for me to come out and share this story in 2018 when I did. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of input from my, my peers in the legal community, which I didn't care about. I was long retired. And, uh, you know, it was split about 50-50. Half the people said, I had no idea that you went, went through all this, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, and I believe you. Uh, and then the other half were like, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? You know, people will think you're nuts. Um, and that's okay, I was perfectly fine with that. Uh, I'm kind of going in chronological order here. In 1963, I was eight years old, and I'm playing in my backyard in St. Louis, Missouri, and we lived in a like row houses uh, with tiny backyards. And this was, it had to be a Saturday or a Sunday or a holiday because I was home. And I was playing with an adult bow and arrow target set that an uncle gave to me. Now, I'd never give my eight-year-olds such a lethal weapon to play with, in, you know, in a crowded neighborhood, but, but they did. So I'm shooting arrows into this bale of hay and beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, and I'm looking down because I'm fitting the notch of an arrow into the string of my bow, and as I'm looking down, a perfectly round shadow passes over the top of my head and in front of me. And instinctively, I looked up, and I saw a perfectly round saucer. You know, I'm not good with estimating how big the thing was, uh, this whole event didn't last that long, but I'd say 25 or 30 feet in diameter, so relatively speaking, it was big. And I was absolutely stunned, uh, in a happy way. I thought, wow. And I'm looking at this thing, and you know, as a, as a little boy, I'd put together model airplanes, and I had an idea about what things that fly, you know, I'm looking for some type of propulsion system or rivets or markings to identify the thing as Russian or American. Uh, and there's nothing, just polished aluminum that kind of curled up at the ends. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, I was really disappointed I couldn't see the top of the thing. You know, and the word, the word sexy wasn't in my lexicon. I, when I was, you know, I think the word that I used was bitchin'. I, <laughs> I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. I mean, and it, it impressed me the way that a, a new sports car on a showroom floor would, would impress me. It, it was just, it was just cool. It was a very neat experience. And for some reason, I felt the, the need to lie down on my back and look up to get a better view of it. Now, I don't know what possessed me to do that, and it makes no sense, but that's what I did. And the lawn had been freshly mowed. And of all our senses, sight, sound, etc., the smell of that freshly mowed grass will just about every time take me back to that event. Um, 
Also, we lived in a crowded neighborhood. So there are people to the right of us, people to the back of us, little backyards, and people are, are cutting grass and uh, walking dogs and playing, and there's cars and cats and trucks and uh, the noise of, of the city. And as soon as I laid eyes on this thing, all those sounds were, were baffled, muffled. It was like I had taken my hands and pressed them against my ears. And I could barely hear, you know, mumbling and, and noise, but for the most part, everything was muted. And I watched this thing wobble a little bit in the breeze. And eventually, it kind of did a list to starboard because it was near some power lines and just shot off at 500 miles an hour and is gone in the sky. And I'm, I stand up, I get to my feet, and I'm looking at this. I call it a hole in the sky. There was no physical hole in the sky, but it's the point where this thing disappeared. And for years, when I'd come in the backyard, my eyes would automatically go to where I last saw this thing, thinking, well, wow, is it going to come back? Will I see it again? Um, and I, you know, I ran into my mother, and I said, Mom, Mom, I saw a flying saucer. And she's like, Terry, calm down. You did not see a flying saucer. Uh, you know, what you saw was a jet. It was probably a jet. Terry, you know what jets are. And I said, no, Mom, this wasn't a jet. It didn't have wings. It didn't have a, a rocket engine. It didn't have anything like, the, like a, a plane would have. And she's frustrated. And she gets our, our, you know, our one-volume encyclopedia, and she's showing me pictures of dirigibles. And I like, no, 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 that's not it. That's not it. So finally, in frustration, she gives me a piece of paper and says, draw what you saw. And I drew a circle and handed it back to her. I said, that's what I saw. And uh, I got a lot of teasing and a lot of uh, a hard time from both of my older sisters um, and from the kids in the neighborhood. But it was a, it was a cool event for me. I, I, really, I really liked it. I enjoyed it. And I, I didn't realize that people didn't want to hear this, you know, in, in 1963. I didn't have anybody that had any level of empathy that could say, yeah, you know, I, I saw one too. It just, they didn't exist. And I started to have nightmares about this thing. Even though I, it, was a pleasant, uh, it was a pleasant encounter for me, for some reason I had nightmares of them taking me someplace. And my parents decided to take me to a doctor, right? So they take me to the family general practitioner, and they explain that I'm having screaming nightmares once or twice a week, and they, they, they want the doctor to look at me, examine me, and tell, me what, tell them what's wrong, with, and find out what's wrong with me so it can be fixed. Um, so I sit down with the family doctor, and he said, Terry, I understand you saw a flying saucer, is that right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, let me ask Dad to excuse himself, and we'll just talk man to man. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, did, I didn't trust this guy. <laughs> and he said, Terry, I'm your doctor. I take care of you. You know that. He said, I want you to tell me honestly what you saw. And uh, it'll just be between us. And I'm like, okay. I saw a flying saucer in the backyard over my head. And he said, I see. And he asked me a couple questions. What color was it? Did you hear anything? Uh, and I answered him, and he's like, hmm, yes, I see. So he calls my dad back into the room, and he says, well, I've, I've discovered the problem. It's too much lost in space. It's too much space ghost. You got to change the way this kid watches television. <laughs> so that was the cure. So I go home, and my dad and mom decide that I should watch The Three Stooges. <laughs> that that would be a healthier alternative to Space Ghost. I'm like, okay, okay. I mean, when you're eight, slapstick comedy is funny for just a little bit. But, you know, after a couple of weeks, it's like, uh, you know. And I know Mo, Larry, and Curly were getting on my mom and dad's last nerve, and my sister's. So they're like, Terry. Why don't you watch something else? Can't watch cartoons, watch something else. So I turned on Perry Mason. 
Then I'm eight years old, and I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. I also had a thing for Della Street, but... <laughs> I made up my mind, and I guess I'm fortunate to know what career path I was going to take. I made up my mind there and then that I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to do what Perry Mason did. That looked like fun. That looked cool. My dad drove a truck. I know he'd come home dirty and tired. I didn't want to do that. So uh, that, that became my life's ambition. So I had a quiet couple of years, and in 1966, at age 11, on a bitterly cold January night, not long after Christmas, I'm in my second-story bedroom toward the, back of, toward the front of the house, and uh, my mom tucks me in at night, normal evening in all regard. Uh, I didn't watch anything spooky on television. Uh, mom comes in and tucks me in like she always did. Typical night. And I laid down and I went to sleep. And I went to sleep immediately. And I woke up sometime in the middle of the night. I don't know what time it was, but I woke up and I heard this humming noise, this low bass kind of humming noise. Uh, and I saw lights, pardon me, lights coming in through my bedroom window. And this was an old drafty house and it had uh, Venetian blinds and thick, heavy drapery. And these lights were flashing through uh, the drapes and lighting up my bedroom like a ballpark at night. And I'm trying to think, what is this? And I'm running through the mental list. I said, it must be a fire truck. It must be a fire truck. must be a fire across the street. So I, I hop out of bed, and this low humming noise was like being next to a big, ba a big speaker and somebody playing a bass note, and you get that vibration that you can feel in your chest. Really, it's not so much loud as it is powerful. And I had a little desk next to the window, and I had these model airplanes I'd assembled, and they were kind of vibrating and dancing on top of the desk, and one of them fell off onto the floor. I thought, oh, I've got to pick that up. And I pulled back the curtains, and I opened the blinds, and right outside my bedroom window on the second story is this silver disc. And I remember just absolutely being over the moon because I could see the top of the thing this time. <laughs> and it was a classic uh, UFO with a, a, a dome structure in the middle. Uh, the rest was, was uh, like polished aluminum. Uh, same size. I, I wondered, you know, could be the same UFO. Who knows? I didn't know. Uh, and I'm looking at this thing, and uh, I had no fear whatsoever. It was more like, wow. Uh, Underneath this thing, that was a bitterly cold January night, but underneath this thing, there was this fog uh, all around it. And uh, the, our, our uh, household dog, King, was not involved in this. He wasn't interested in this. And when I look back on it, I think that's unusual because normally he would be in my room barking like crazy and uh, interested but he wasn't. Uh, he was asleep down the hall. And I, I wonder about that. You know, he was reluctant to go in my bedroom for about six months after this happened. You know, I could coax him in with pizza crust or something, but he, he wasn't interested in being in there. And that's interesting to me, because I think animals have a sixth sense about these things. So I, I pulled back the drapes and I tucked them into the Venetian blinds so I can get a unobstructed view, and I'm just watching this thing, and emotionally I felt um, privileged. I felt like, you know, 1963 years ago when I saw the flying saucer in the backyard, it wasn't just a one-on, you know, like, like they said in the cartoons of the day, you know, they didn't just make a wrong turn in Albuquerque and wind up, you know, outside or in my backyard. I, I believed that these things were coming to see me with purpose. And uh, I felt good about that. I felt, uh, you know, very privileged to have seen them. And, I, you know, I'm watching this thing, and after a few minutes, it, it lost my interest totally. And I was absolutely 
just uh, almost bored. And I turned around and I went back to bed with this thing still outside my windows and the lights flashing. And I lie down and I, I close my eyes and it seemed like I no longer laid down than I opened my eyes and it was morning. It seemed like there was no time pass. I had no dreams. I had no, no conscious memory of the passage of time. It was just boom. Shut my eyes, open them, morning. And you know, when I got up, I didn't at first remember this event. And my feet hit the floor, and I saw that airplane, that little F-4 Phantom that I put together on the floor. And then I remembered, oh yeah, this happened last night. And then my attention was drawn to the window, and I saw that the drapery had been tucked, tucked into the Venetian blinds. And I smiled because I knew the, what happened to me was real. And it, it, was, it was a real event. And, you know, I went down for breakfast and I'm like, hey, anybody see the fire truck last night you know, across the street? You know, no, uh-uh, didn't see a thing. So nobody in the household saw anything. And I just don't know how that could be. Uh, and again, I... This wasn't a dream, this wasn't sleep paralysis. I know what this was. This was, I saw something um, that I think came from someplace other than here, other than Earth. I mean, it wasn't put together in Boeing. Uh, at, but I, I'm thinking, you know, with my rudimentary education in, in the solar system, well, this thing had to come from Mars or Venus, right? I'm thinking that, and I'm thinking, you know, this is a nuts and bolts kind of thing, just like the little model airplanes that I put together. And, and I look at this thing and I'm thinking, you know, this had to be assembled in a factory on another planet. And I thought that was, that was pretty neat. And it meant that there was probably a crew of uh, workmen on Mars that went to work every day in a factory and put these things together. And at night they went home to their wives and had dinner. And in my mind, I had this construct of a whole culture on Mars. And I'm thinking, wow, that's really pretty cool. And you know, I, I still have that thought today. When I see something in the sky, I wonder about the backstory. It had to come from somewhere. It wasn't, it wasn't just created like by magic. Uh, you know, and, and well, there's, there's some... There are some people who think that these things are alive, that these ships are actually living, and there are some people that think that these things did come from Boeing, and they came from our government, and they put together, and we see them for some reason. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know where it came from. All I know is what I saw, uh, and that, that was my experience. So. Where am I at? Life went on. Life did go on. I was age 11, and I had 10 glorious years of no interaction with ET whatsoever. And I'm 22 years old. I'm active duty in the Air Force. Uh, I'm an enlisted guy driving an ambulance, and I loved my job. And the guy I worked with was named Toby, and we became fast friends. Uh, we worked the night shift in the emergency room as first responders from about 11 o'clock p.m. to 9 a.m. the following morning. Um, and, uh, you know, there wasn't much going on at night. There were very few officers around. We loved it, you know. And, when, you know, the phone didn't ring. We could play, play hearts or, uh, you know, read a book or do something. And uh, it was a good way to spend your time on active duty. And... One night we're playing hearts, and uh, Toby says, hey man, I got an idea, let's go camping. And I thought, camping? Because I was a city kid, I, I grew up in St. Louis, and I knew that Toby grew up in Flint. I knew that I'd never been camping in my life, and I highly suspected he'd never been camping in his life. And I'm like, where'd you get this idea? What's this all about? And he says, no man, think about it. He was really enthused, no man, think about it. He said, um, I got a, a leaflet, I got a flyer from this guy uh, about this Devil's Den State Park down in Arkansas, just on the other side of the border. 
And I'm like, look, man, we got a dozen state parks around us. You know, we're in the middle of uh, nowhere. Knob Noster State Park is right outside the gates of the base. Why don't we just go there and save the gas? And he's like, yeah, I know, but uh, think about the, you know, isn't the journey part of the experience? You know, we can get away from the base and get away from everything for a couple of days and go down and camp and see if we like it. Toby and I were both newly married, and, and he said, you know, let's go down and see if we like it, and if we do, we'll take our wives next time. Well, I suspected my wife wouldn't like this, but... Uh, and I told him, I said, why don't we just save the gas and sit in my garage for the night and eat bugs and we get the same result. <laughs> but, you know, that planted a seed. This was in April. And within 48 hours, I kind of became obsessed with this idea. And I really, really wanted to go. So I explained to my wife, this is what we're going to do. It's going to be a trip to reconnoiter, and we'll see. And next time, you know, you and Tammy, Toby's wife, can come, and the four of us will go. Um, and she was like, that's okay. I mean, our wives knew we didn't, you know, we didn't party, we didn't golf, we didn't fish, we didn't do any of those things. We were kind of family people. And uh, she's like, sure, go, go, and ha go and have some fun. So... We did. We made plans. Uh, and we, we planned this trip out in the squadron, uh, in the hospital squadron. We were like the two nerds of the squadron, you know? The nerds weren't, uh, I, I forget what they would call us, but they made fun of us, but that's okay. So how do two guys that are kind of on the nerdy end of the spectrum, how do they go about planning a camping trip when they've never been camping before? You know, there's no Google. So we went to the base library and thought we could find a book on camping that would spell out what we should do, what we should bring, and of course nothing like that existed. So Toby found a 1958 copy of a Boy Scout manual. <laughs> and he's real excited and we get together in his living room and I got a pad and a pen and I'm like, all right man, give me some instructions, tell me what you got. So he starts off flipping through this book and he's like, uh, let's see, uh, tying nautical knots. Now we're not going to do any of that. And then, uh, and I'm serious, and, and the, next, the next chapter was on taxidermy. And I'm like, no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but there was nothing to tell you how to, how to go out and do this. And maybe we're just, we had no exposure to it. And we're asking people in the hospital, hey, how do, we're going to plan a camping trip down to Devil's Den. How do we go about doing that? And they would look at Leah like we're nuts and say, you know, you go to Kmart or Walmart, you buy a $10 tent, and you have your wives pack you a bunch of sandwiches, and you fill your tank up with gas, and you drive down to the park and, and set it up, build a little fire, and have fun. Look, well, okay, sounds good to me. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a plan. And I really can't stress how obsessed I became with this idea and in retrospect, when I look back at it, I wonder, where did that, where did that obsession come from? Um, I've had people suggest to me that maybe Toby was manipulated somehow, and maybe he was involved in getting me down there. I don't think that's true, but, but I have heard that. So we made an exhaustive list of things to bring. And, you know, we were responsible for restocking an ambulance, so we were pretty good at knowing what we need and making sure everything was in there. And despite all this planning, when the day to go came, the, the wheels fell off. And I had borrowed a nice camp lantern and some fuel and a hand axe from a neighbor. And I left them sitting in my garage. And that's just, I'm just not that inept. And Toby had the same kind of problem. Uh, he forgot several things. And at the time, I, I was an amateur photographer. I had a nice Yashica camera. I had a little dark room set up in back of my house. And I loved taking photographs. But unfortunately, when you live on a... We lived in, both lived in NCO housing. When you live on a nuclear base, there ain't a heck of a lot you can do with a camera. So I had taken photographs of the moon with a telephoto lens in my backyard. 
But I was really, really eager to go take some pictures of some wildlife, maybe see some deer, some eagles. I thought, yeah, that, that'd be fun, that'd be a good time. So I bought all this special film and filters uh, and all the stuff you need, and I got it all packed in my camera bag, and we head south towards Devil's Den State Park. And we're about halfway there, and it dawned on me. In my, in my mind's eye, I saw my camera bag sitting on the kitchen counter. How could I do that? How could I do that? And I told Toby, I said, Toby, man, I think I left my camera at home. He's like, nah, no way. And he said, pull this thing over. We'll find your camera. It's in the trunk. And of course, it wasn't. It was sitting on my kitchen table. Now, I mean, Toby had a camera, so it wasn't like we didn't have anything to shoot pictures with, but I wanted my camera. So that was kind of disappointing. You know, and I'm upset, and Toby's like, man, don't worry about it. Those eagles, the deer, they'll, they'll all be there again. We'll come back. And I said, yeah, you know, you're right. I try not to let it ruin my, ruin my uh, journey. And we had agreed not to stay in a campground, to not get a camping permit. We were going to drive and find our own place in the woods and, you know, be like real outdoorsmen. You know, it's our first time camping. We're going to be real outdoorsmen. <laughs> and I, I told Toby, I said, man, look, if we stay in the campground, we'll have electricity, we'll have water, you know, we'll have access to hot showers. Uh, isn't that worth something? And he made what I thought was a valid uh, rebuttal. He says, look, you know, if we stay in the campground, we're going to have people to the right of us, people to the left of us. He said, Where, where's the fun in that? There's going to be children and other undesirables running all over the place. <laughs> and he said, you know, why don't we just you know, camp in Walmart's parking lot, be the same thing. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, man, I think you're right. So we're, we're feeling like Lewis and Clark. We are just, just feeling like big adventurers. And uh, in fairness, this was all new to us. And so we dodged the ranger station, and we took this road that was paved, that turned to gravel, that turned to dirt, and we came to a chain across the road with this sternly worded sign that said, uh, no trespassing, no hunting, no camping, no fishing, no hiking, no nothing. Uh, and I'm like, well, I guess we've got to turn around and go back. And Toby's like, you know, this is probably a nature preserve or something. I don't think it's a big deal. What's, what are they going to do with the worst, throw us out? He said, let's, let's go see what they got in there. I'm like, yeah, how are we going to get around this? He says, trust me, I got this. He hops out of the passenger car, my old Impala, and what they had done, these, these park rangers, had made a noose-like thing out of the chain and secured it with a padlock and then draped it on a nail on the opposing post so they, they could come and go and not have to fumble with keys, right? And it kind of looked like it was locked. So Toby picked up the chain and dropped it, and chink, it fell to the ground, and... We were like, woohoo, we're in, you know? <laughs> and we pulled in. It, the mistake that we made was we didn't put that chain back up. And I think that tipped off the rangers to know that somebody had, is, you know, rummaging around in the park. So we went in, and Devil's Den, probably a, a bunch of folks have been there already or have, have, have had an experience in Devil's Den. And, uh, the, the road was kind of windy, and it was uh, nothing but trees on either side of us. And we're kind of looking for this uh, raised area of ground that the fishermen told us about, told Toby about. And uh, it, it was odd, because we could have made a dozen right or left turns, and Toby's like, go this way. And Toby was the one that had the unerring sense of direction. When I drove an ambulance, I always drove and he always navigated because he was one of these people you could blindfold and spin around and tell him to point north and he would say, that way. So he had some kind of good sense of direction. And we found this plateau. You know, in, in 2016, 2017, when I was assembling the... Uh, backstory for this book, I thought about going to Google Earth and trying to find a picture of where we stayed. Because it was uh, an elevated plateau, 
and the treetops all around it were level with the top of this plateau. And if you go on Google Earth, you'll find it. The picture is right there, and it's not part of Devil's Den State Park. It's actually on land that's owned by the Bureau of Land Management, so it's federal land. Uh, and it's still restricted, so I'm told. I haven't been back, but that's what people have told me. And there's a dirt road that goes at a, at a good uh, incline that takes you to the top of this, I call it a plateau. Um, and we crested the top of this, and we saw this big open field in front of us with, you know, grass and late-blooming wildflowers, and, and it was just gorgeous. And, you know, we do a high five, and we're thinking, this is, this is going to be great. And because from the edge of this plateau, I could, we could see out all over the forest. I thought, you know, I'll photograph eagles with Toby's camera. And we, uh, we set up a camp, we set up a little campsite. And we did all, kind of the, all the fun stuff you do when you camp. And it was, it was fun because it was all new to us. And, you know, we went for a hike. Um, I think it's because we were used to working a night shift, but we did this uh, pretty strenuous hike, and we're on this uh, limestone bluff with an overhang of some foliage, and that was just real pleasant. And we stretched out, and uh, we both fell asleep, which I thought was unusual. Uh, but again, we're used to sleeping in the afternoon, so maybe it's not all that unusual. And I woke up to Toby kicking me, saying, get up, get up, man, get up. And uh, I got up, and he said, the sun's going to go down. He says, we're going to be in this forest in the middle of the night if we don't get back before the sun sets. So we raced back to our campsite. We got there just as it was kind of twilight. And I went and uh, I assembled. Toby's job was to put the tent together, because he had kids, and he put toys together. So that would make him more you know, more of an expert at that. And I went out to just grab as much uh, firewood as I could find. And I didn't have the hand axe, so I went out and I got, you know, grass and twigs and, you know, a couple pieces of wood. And I kept stacking them until we had this big uh, potential bonfire. And we put a, uh, our air mattresses on either side. And we're kicked back and we throw a match into this thing, and it just goes whoosh, of course, because it's half grass. And uh, we thought that was fun. And <laughs> we did the hot dog thing and some, uh, some uh, marshmallows and uh, uh, talked about stuff. And I remember telling Toby, you know, man, I, I could see where people would enjoy this. This is pleasant. And, you know, he has to brag. He's like, yeah, man, I told you, this is, this is, this is good stuff. And while we're, while we're sitting there talking, it's getting on to about 9 o'clock p.m., and we had a little difficulty hearing one another from across from this, over this campfire, because of the crickets, the tree frogs, all the things in the forest that make noise at night. And it, it was loud. And I noticed that that all stopped, and it was dead silent. And it wasn't only dead silent, it was still. Uh, this was June, it was a hot night, and we had been enjoying a little bit of a breeze, and that quit too. And now all I'm hearing is the fire crackle, and that's it. And this unnerved me. And I asked Toby, you know, like Toby's going to know, is, is this normal? And, you know, he kind of makes fun of me and said, yeah, don't worry about the bugs. The bugs will come back. We've been laughing and cutting up. We just quieted them. They'll, they'll come back. Um, but I still felt uneasy. And a little while later, he asked me, he has his head turned to the west, away from me, and he says, Terry, were those lights there before? And I look, and I can't see anything. Uh, well, his torso was in the way. So I stood up, and I looked over, and on the horizon in the west were three little, what looked like stars. They were too bright. They were brighter than the stars in the sky. And they formed a tight little triangle. 
and they were too far above the horizon to have been lights from a train or from a, from a uh, shopping mall or something. And besides, we were in the middle of nowhere. There was, there was nothing around us. Um, I understand it's built up a little bit today. There are some houses, and, uh, but back then there was, there was nothing. And uh, we're both talking, well, what, you know, what are these things? And I'm t I said, well, you know what, this must be an aircraft of some kind, because we were familiar with aircraft, and I said, I don't know what the light configuration is all about, but it's probably headed in our direction, so until it varies its path by a degree or two, it's going to look static, like it's just stuck there. So we watch for a few minutes, and it, and it doesn't change. It just stays right where it's at. And then it moves, and what it did first was it rotated like these three stars were on an axis, and it turned about 120 degrees and aligned the base of the triangle parallel with the horizon. And we were both excited for a moment, and, uh, you know, when I look back, I... I understand how muted our emotions were. You know, two, two people witness something like this, and I think human nature is you want to talk about it, you want to validate it. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? You know, what is this thing? And there was none of that exchange. It was, we were pretty much quiet. Um, and while we're watching, this thing suddenly start to climb up into the sky. And uh, I don't think we said a word. We just watched it. And I noticed that uh, before, when things first went quiet, I'd had this uneasy feeling. And that was gone. I didn't have that anymore. And I felt like I was almost like an observer rather than a participant in these events. And it, I, was, I was in a weird place, but... Um, I was just interested in watching what was happening. And we saw these three stars move up to what I thought called a ceiling, uh, as far as it would go up. How far, I don't know. I couldn't tell how big the thing was. I had nothing to compare it to size-wise. Uh, but it stopped. And then this orientation of three stars forming a triangle changed and this thing turned like this. And when it did, it went from being a triangle to three lights, boom, boom, boom. And the center light was pointed in our direction. And it crossed my mind, this thing's headed towards us. And it did, it started like a glide plane down. And what, what was interesting was, twice during its descent into the forest, it did this somersault-like thing, where the apex of the triangle, there, there were lights on each point of the triangle, obviously. The, the point on the uh, tip pointed towards us would dip down, and we saw this thing do a complete somersault. So it went from uh, being three lights and then kind of a triangle thing again, and completed the somersault. And I thought, well, that, that's kind of interesting. And it did it a second time, and I really felt that that was done for our benefit. Whether that's true or not, I don't, I don't have a clue, but it, it felt that way. And we saw it glide in over the top of the forest and, and light up the forest with these lights, and then it dimmed the lights somewhat, and it came to a stop right over this plateau where we're sitting. And we were near an edge, so we weren't in the middle and right underneath the thing, thank God. So we were kind of offset. And uh, it stopped at about 3,000 feet. There wasn't uh, really sound of any kind. It was just silent. And it was 3,000 feet up in the air. I'm guesstimating, but I think I'm probably very close. And this thing was enormous. I mean, to me, it was enormous. It was, uh, and I'm not exaggerating when I say it was the size of a Walmart or a medical building. Uh, it was big. It was just big. And um, 
You know, there's no conversation between the two of us. We're just watching this thing, and I can't take my eyes off of it, and I'm just fascinated by it. And I have these waves of, it felt like, almost like um, sedation, but I didn't feel any anxiety, excitement. I had no emotion whatsoever. Uh, and that's a very strange place to be when you're looking at something like this. And uh, from the center of this thing, there came a light um, that hit right in the middle of our campfire. And it was a, a beam of light, about six inches in diameter. And it turned on just like somebody hit a switch. And this white light is in the middle of our campfire. And when I say a white light, what I mean is uh, it had this quality to it like a high power searchlight cutting through fog. You know, you can see that column of light. Well, it had that quality to it, but there, of course, there was no fog. And uh, this lasted, you know, 90 seconds or something. And then it turned off. And then immediately in, it, in its stead, there came a laser light. Now, this is 1977. I'd seen lasers on TV, but I'd never seen one in real life before. And this thing shot down a laser beam about the diameter of a pencil that was reddish and purple in color. And it would land at one spot in our campsite for really just a millisecond and then reappear in another place so that, you know, in a span of 10 seconds, this thing's in, you know, 10 different places in our campsite. And uh, the, the laser beam struck me at least twice in the chest, never felt a thing. Uh, it hit our tent, our car, uh, Toby's backpack, the cooler that he brought. And I, I had the feeling, you know, this thing's checking us out. It's scanning us. And, and I think that's probably accurate. So that lasted for a couple of minutes. And then, that stopped. And we're sitting there in silence, and we got this thing 3,000 feet over our head. And that calm, sedated feeling that we had transitioned to sleepy. Because calm and sleepy are two, two different things. And where I felt mildly sedated before, now, suddenly, all I wanted to do was go into that tent and go to sleep. And Toby was thinking likewise. And I can't tell you how strong that compulsion was to go into the tent and go to sleep. And I think it, it speaks to the power that these things can have over us in this kind of situation, because I think there was some level of influence over us. And we got up, we picked up our uh, air mattresses, and we went over to our tent. We threw the air mattresses in, and I fell on top of mine. I didn't bother to undress. I had on a t-shirt, uh, blue jeans, and I wore my combat boots. And I just fell on top of the air mattress, and I was, I was out. And I had no dreams. Uh, I was just out for a period of time. A and I woke up. There were these flashing lights, very much like what I experienced at age 11 when I saw the lights through the, the heavy drapery in my home in St. Louis. I saw these lights you know, lighting up the tent from outside, and they were bright. I mean, they were really bright. And I'm thinking, what can this be? I wake up, and I really don't have my wits about me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, we're camping. That's right. And um, in my mind, my mind's racing for a reasonable explanation of this, and I'm thinking, it's got to be a park ranger's truck, you know, with those, those uh, lights on top of it. And... Uh, the lights weren't at regular intervals, uh, and that was odd. So I, I really didn't know what was going on, and I sat up. And when I sat up, I noticed that my... Pardon me, just a moment, please. Thank you. My combat boots had been unlaced almost all the way down. And it was dark in the tent, unless and until these lights flashed, then I could see inside the tent. And I saw my boots were unlaced. I thought, what? I know I didn't go to bed with them like that. 
And, I, you know, they, in the military, they teach you to take care of your feet, and that would be a, a trip hazard, and I, I would have taken them off, or I would have left them on. I was certain I left them on my feet. And I wasn't afraid, uh, but I was annoyed. And I took off my boots, and my socks are on sideways. And that really confused me, because I knew I would never do that. And it hadn't dawned on me yet that I'd been undressed and redressed. Um, that would come later. So I took my boots off, put my socks on correctly, and laced up my boots, and I turned my attention to the left to my friend. And he's on his knees, peeking out through this flap of the, of the tent, and he's just intently looking at something. And one of these flashes of light I could see there was a track of a tear going down to the right side of his face. And for the first time in this whole thing, I felt fear. That scared me, because I couldn't imagine what would make this man cry. And I guess the saline lights up from the tent, but I could see a distinct tear track down the side of his face. And I asked him, I said, Toby, what are you looking at? What's out there, man? Is it park rangers? Who's out there? What's out there? And he really, he didn't give me a coherent answer. So I got to my knees and I pulled back the flap on my tent and I'm looking out. And what I saw were, I wish I'd counted them, I didn't, but I'd estimate there were 12 to 15 of these classic little guys that we call greys. Now, you know, I published my event and what I saw, and I got emails from people saying, oh no, you got this all wrong, they look like this or they look like that, or you didn't really see the real ones. Um, and I'm sorry, maybe there are a dozen different varieties of things, but I know what I saw. And there were, like I say, a dozen, maybe 15 of these little guys, and I can only really see them clearly when the lights flash on the points of the triangle. And at first, I took them to be children, and I'm like, Confused, I said, Toby, man, what are these kids doing out here in the middle of the night, you know, in the middle of nowhere? And he said, Terry, man, look at them. They're not human beings. And I thought, huh? And I looked closer, and they're all identical. They're gray. They don't have the enormous big black eyes like you see in motion pictures. Uh, they, were, they were smaller. They were, you know, larger than human eyes but they weren't, they weren't enormous. And they walked with a distinctive gait. They walked like they had sore feet or something. I don't know what the deal was with that. And uh, I looked at them and I thought, yeah, they're not human beings. You know, their, their torso was disproportionate to their arms and legs. Their head was larger than it should have been for their frame. And, um, and they're just kind of walking around almost like tourists. They're, you know, nah, nah, nah. I don't, <laughs> don't know what they're looking at, but they're out there walking around. And now I'm terrified, and I'm afraid we're going to cough or sneeze or do something to draw their attention, and they're going to come over. Um, but they were long done with us, and I, we didn't know that. So while we watched, we watched for some time, maybe half an hour, uh, and then from underneath this craft, this craft had descended from 3,000 feet to 30 feet over the floor of this meadow. I almost left that out, and that's hugely important. So this thing that was 3,000 feet over our heads when we went to bed had come now, down, and now it's 30 feet over the floor of this meadow. So thankfully, we were kind of offset to the side, and it wasn't hovering like right over the top of us. But still, it was big, it was intimidating, and, uh, and it was scary. And I, I drew a picture of this, um, and you can find it at terrylovelace.com. Uh, it's easy to find. I drew a picture of this uh, contemporaneous with the event. About 30 days later, drew, drew a picture of what we saw. Uh, and then for this book, I took that loose-leaf notebook paper that I hand-drew and did a more careful drawing with... with uh, pen and ruler, and put a picture of it. Uh, it's on, it's on my, my, my poorly maintained website. And uh, 
while we're watching these little guys with this thing 30 feet over their, over their heads, oh, 30 feet over our heads, uh, another light came on from underneath this thing. And this was another column of white light. And it was like a big cylinder. And I'm guessing it was about 30 feet in diameter because it seemed to be about the same width and breadth as this thing was off the ground. So 30 feet off the ground, 30 foot wide, big column of white light. And it just clicks on. And as soon as it clicks on, these little guys in the field turn their attention toward it. And not in a hurry, but they started to make their way toward it. And uh, it was interesting. It, it, it wasn't frightening, but it was very interesting. And they kind of formed a queue in front of this thing, and two of them, or three of them, would step into this light, and then over the span of about 30 seconds, they would pixelate out. And I had never seen anything like that before, with the exception of, and, and I'll make the disclaimer, I'm not a fan of science fiction. I don't watch science fiction, I have no interest in it. But my wife watched the old Star Trek thing back in the day, and they had this, uh, somebody can help me out here, what do you call it, the, the transporter or something? Where they stand... What's it called? Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me up, Scotty, that's it, yeah. <laughs> they'd stand on these little... Uh, and in Star Trek, they'd stand on these little platforms and they would, they would do the same thing. They would pixelate out. And that's what these guys did. And an assumption on my part, but I think that's how they got back into this craft. Uh, I have no idea how they, how they took us. I have no idea how we got inside that thing. But I had immediate... Please understand, I've never had a clear, linear memory of everything that happened to us that day. But I came away from it with flashes of insight. I, I saw pictures of being inside the thing, and creatures, and just amazing, weird stuff. And the last three guys pixelated out, and that humming noise that we were hearing we had been listening to it so long, we didn't even notice it. It had become like a, a, a baseline noise. And when it stopped and went quiet, uh, it was very noticeable. And that, that hum, that, that droning noise, stopped abruptly. And uh, this thing, the, the lights on the points of the triangle shift from multicolored to just white. And we watched this thing take off. And it didn't take off like a rocket ship. It took off like a hot air balloon. It just lifted up and turned a little bit, and it's going up. And we watched it until it's three points of light in the sky, until it's one point of light in the sky, and then it's gone. And Toby and I are left sitting in the tent. Uh, the thing is gone. There are still no noises of the forest at all. So we're sitting there in complete silence. And my friend starts to hyperventilate, and I tell him, you know, you got to get a hold of your breathing, which he does. And then he says, you know, we got to get out of here. Now, we both wore mechanical watches, wind-up watches, that were kind of state-of-the-art for the day. And because they were integral to the job, if you were going to be a medic and pick up people, you need to take pulse, you need to note times that you arrive at the scene of an accident or something. So our watches were important to us. And both of those watches stopped at 2.30. And that would have been 2.30 a.m. You know, mine stopped at 2.30 on the nose. Toby stopped at, at 2.32. Because we had to, tried to keep our watches synchronized. And uh, mine was a relatively new Elgin watch. You know, I wish I'd saved that watch. You know, and sent it back to Elgin and say, what's wrong with my watch? <laughs> um, because uh, I, I, I wanted to know. And I, you know, I read the paperwork that came with the watch, and there was a warning not to be around, you know, large industrial machinery, or especially anything that would have some kind of magnetic field around it. So 
my assumption is that we went in this craft and there was plenty of that and it froze. Our, but it gave us a, a reference in time. Something happened to us around 2.30 a.m. So when we're back in the tent, we watch this thing take off. We have no idea if it's 3.30 or 5.30 and we're sitting there and like I said, Toby gets hold of his breathing and he's, he's at him. He's like, man, we got to get out of here. We got to leave this tent. We got to get to your car. And, and I said, I ain't going nowhere, you know. All I got is this piece of canvas over my head, but it hides me. It gives me cover. And I don't want to be outside racing to the car because I'll feel very vulnerable. And, you know, to this day, I guess one of the PTSD kind of things, I am really nervous about walking across a field, an open field by myself. Uh, I'll, I'll likely walk a mile and a half around it rather than I will be out in the open uh, because of that vulnerable feeling still is with me. And uh, eventually I grabbed my car keys, my wallet. Toby grabbed, uh, he had a little flashlight and his car keys and uh, I guess his wallet was in his pocket and we bolted from the tent and ran to the car. And... Uh, and for me, that was a scary experience. And we got to the car, it wasn't locked, we hopped in, and I asked Toby, I said, Toby, are you sure we're, we're good here? And I turned on the dome light, and he knew what I was talking about. Is there anything else in here with us? And he looks under the seat, in the back seat, you know, he's got his little flashlight, and he says, no, we're, we're good to go. And I asked him, man, I said, you know, it's pitch dark out here. Are you going to be able to help me maneuver this old Impala out of here without breaking an axle? And he said, yeah, I think I can do that. So we did. And we left, we left our tent, Toby's backpack with his name and address in it. <laughs> we left his cooler. We left everything. You know, we took the clothes on our back and got into my car and got the hell out of there and we're happy to be gone. And I, Toby navigated, you know, flawlessly and in a little while we hit a paved top road and I felt like, oh, well, everything's going to be okay, I think. And um, very little conversation between the two of us. And I should mention that we both uh, suffered an injury, same injuries. Uh, I had, we both had, what they call flash burns to the eyes. Uh, it's what like an arc welder would get if they didn't wear that smoke glass hood. And it's, it's kind of like just a sunburn to the cornea of your eye. And, and it's painful. And it's very photophobic. The sun hurts. So when the sun came up, that was hard. And uh, I also had the worst sunburn I'd ever had in my life. I never blistered but I was red all over every square inch of my body. Uh, and I mean everywhere. And I didn't understand that. I, to this day, I don't understand where I got that. But I have memories of being in this ship, and I'll try to get through them and give you some idea of what I saw. But the inside of that trip, uh, ship was just lit up incredibly bright. I mean, it was light pouring out of the windows, and I don't understand how this thing could land at Devil's Den State Park and it not be seen in five counties. That really just blows my mind. Uh, and it wasn't. I, I can find no, no evidence of it. You know, that, that field where we camped, uh, as I said, I, I didn't bother looking on Google Earth because I thought it'd be full of mature trees by now, but it's not. And I took the Google Earth pictures and I put them on my Facebook page when I used to maintain a Facebook page. And a guy that I talked to who was from Alabama, who was a uh, landscaping guy, emailed me and said that when he blew these images up, he could see tracks that he recognized as from a tractor and what he called a brush hog. I, I never heard the word before, but something, I guess, like a big mower deck you tow behind this, this tractor. And he said, somebody goes up there and clear cuts that so trees don't grow on it. And to this day, all there is is that dirt road that goes straight up. 
Now, this is owned by the Bureau of Land Management, and I wondered, why would they, for 50 years, pay somebody to go up and clear-cut the top of this thing? What's the object of that exercise? I don't know. Uh, you know, and then they've got to pay somebody a salary to do it. Uh, and burn gas, and it just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So what is the purpose of that plateau? I have no clue. Uh, I mean, I can guess and make assumptions all day long, but whatever it is, it's important enough to the Bureau of Land Management to keep it trimmed and uh, keep it the way it is. And I just find that interesting. That was a surprise to me. I wasn't expecting that. So we're headed back toward the base, and we got a six-hour drive ahead of us. And uh, we made a, a pact. We, we agreed that neither one of us would speak a word about this experience. It was in 1977. We worked in a hospital squadron, so we, we knew how this worked. If, if you came and you reported that you saw something, and if it were any more intimate than just a silver disc darting across the sky that might be explained by a jet or something. If you came and you claimed some kind of experience like this, they would immediately send you for a psych evaluation. No question. 1977? Absolutely. And we didn't want that because we didn't want to risk being thrown out of the Air Force. You know, we were there for a purpose. We wanted to get the GI Bill, get out, complete our schooling, move on with our lives. And um, we didn't want that to happen. And we took, we were, were ethical people. I mean, I, I said, you know, we can't lie. What are we going to do? And Toby says, well, let's tell them the truth. He said, let's tell them that we went to bed feeling odd, woke up sick as dogs and hurting, and didn't care about a $10 Kmart tent. We just got in a car and came home. So we agreed that would be, that would be our, our story. We just leave out the part about a UFO the size of Walmart. <laughs> and we drove back, and I read a lot of books. I, I wasn't into UFOs. I didn't read the literature. It gave me nightmares. I didn't watch anything on TV. Um, but in, in 2017, when I was researching this book, I read a book by a man named Raymond Fowler about four people, a set of twins and two other guys. And these guys were like the four musketeers. You know, they fished together, hunted together, drank together, did everything together. And they're on this fishing trip to the Allagash River up in Maine. And they're in a canoe, and they're going to go night fishing. So because, I guess, if you're going to be out on the lake in the middle of the night, you're going to need some kind of reference to get you back to your campsite. So these guys built this enormous, they were better at this than I was, enormous stack of wood and this huge bonfire. And that would be their, their, their beacon. They would know how to get back to their campsite. So according to, to Ray Fowler's book, and, and if, if you want to read a good book, that's, that's a very good book, they rode out into the middle of this lake, and they saw at first what they took to be the moon. And it was a white light, and it shined on them, and then it lit up the inside of that aluminum canoe. And then these guys panicked, and they're scared, and they're paddling like crazy to get back to the shore. Everything is black, everything is blank. This is missing time. And, you know, the experience of missing time it's just like taking motion picture film and splicing a 20-foot piece of it, or pardon me, cutting out a 20-foot piece of it and then splicing it back together. It, there's no, there's, it's seamless. Um, and these guys got back to the campsite and had no memory of what happened. But what was interesting was they, um, they didn't do... Like Toby and I, they, you know, you would think human beings, four of them who are friends, go through this event they would want to uh, each validate each other's story. They'd want to talk about it. And they didn't. They just went to bed. And uh, the, I call it the band breaks up. 
I, ha I had a bunch of people write to me and tell me about they had this experience, and I would email them back, and I said, well, you know, do you still see your friends? And they're like, no, we kind of drifted apart. So I don't know if that's our own psychological defense mechanism or some kind, or again, some kind of influence these things have over us. I don't know. Uh, but Ray, in Ray Fowler's book, he talks about the four of these guys drifted apart, and one of them were a set of identical twins, and you know, they're, they're normally pretty close to one another, and even they kind of drifted apart. And then one day, one brother calls the other and says, man, you know, I'm having these horrible nightmares. And he started to tell his nightmare, and his brother cut him off and finished the nightmare for him. And that's when they realized that maybe something's going on here. And they went and they saw a psychologist, and they went through hypnotic regression, and they had, you know, incredible memories, and they knew that they had been abducted. And the four of them got together, uh, took lie detector tests, and, you know, went on Good Morning America and whatever shows you go on, and told their story in the early 70s, mid-70s. And, uh, but later on, one of the guys, one of the four, retracted his statements and said, no, I don't think that ever happened. So I find that interesting. So three of the four hung with their story. They were all, you know, cross-examined. They were all hypnotized separately from one another, so they couldn't contaminate their stories with, you know. And uh, they, they had very consistent, very scary stories. So I, I bring all this up to say that on my way back, um, my feelings for Toby as my friend changed. And that was unsettling to me, because if you're my friend, you're my friend. And uh, I'm pretty loyal to my friends, but for some reason, I wanted nothing to do with the guy. And I think he felt the same way. And we sat in silence for that whole, that whole trip back. You know, we, we spoke enough to make that pact that we wouldn't tell anyone what really happened to us. Um, we finally got the base, got inside, went to NCO housing. I dropped him off at his house, and it was just like, see ya. And I, I drove to my house and uh, walked in, and my wife said, oh, you're home early. How was your, oh, what happened to you? And I said, I don't, I don't know. And uh, she put her hand on my forehead. She said, you're, you're burning up. And I had a, a temperature of 103. So she said, I'm going to draw a tepid bath for you. And she says, you know, you've got to go to the hospital. Something's wrong with you. And, you know, that's kind of an embarrassment because I worked at the hospital. I, I, I really didn't want to go. But, you know, I, I went anyway because I, I felt sick enough that I needed to go. And, you know, when I got there, they were all friendly. They were all my friends, and they were, more, they were very supportive. Um, I got there, and I had the most intense examination I'd ever had in my life by a couple of doctors. And they took pictures, photographs of my, my burns. Um, they let me keep my eyes closed during the exam because of the overhead light uh, hurt my eyes. And uh, I had this, this, this really in-depth examination. And I found out later, one of the doctors went to my wife and gave her a bag and said, I want you to please go home and bag up his boots, socks, clothing, everything that he brought back with him. Uh, you know, anything. If he brought back souvenirs or a rock or a fossil or something, put it in a bag and bring it back to us. And uh, she did as she was told, and she brought back these things. I never saw those items again. They, they did reissue me a new pair of combat boots, uh, but my clothing and all was gone. I guess they wanted to... Uh, study it forensically for whatever they could find. But that's what they did. Toward the end of my examination, uh, three guys came into the exam room. One was the hospital commander, who I knew well, and, and I thought was a very good guy. We got along well. The other was the base commander, 
who I'd seen at ceremonies and stuff. I never spoke to the guy, I didn't know him at all. And there was a third guy in civilian clothing, I didn't know who he was. But these three guys came in and asked the doctor if he could excuse himself, they wanted to talk to me. So he shut the door on the way out, and the hospital commander spoke to me, and he said, Sergeant Lovelace, you're to have no contact with Sergeant Tobias in any way, shape, or form. That means you can't call him on the phone. You can't speak to him in person. You can't communicate him by passing notes from a third party. If you run into him at the base exchange, you know, in the frozen pea aisle, you got to turn your cart around and walk in the opposite direction and leave the building. And he went on and on and on, kind of like a modern personal protection order you'd get. And uh, he said, this is an order, and if you disobey my order, Sergeant, there will be consequences. Do you understand? I mean, I understood consequences, but the reason why, I really didn't understand. But I was in a place in my head in regard to Toby that I thought, you know, this really doesn't make, make much difference. I'm in no mood to see him. They kept us in separate exam rooms. They kept us in private rooms, which were really at a premium. Normally, only officers or critically ill people were put in the private rooms, but we both had a private room. And I was there for three days and two nights. And on the morning of my last day, uh, or the evening of my last day, my night nurse came in, who I knew. I knew I'd be going home in the morning, and she brought something to help me sleep and something for the pain uh, in the form of an injection. And two guys in blue business suits followed her into my room. And, you know, I don't want to stereotype anybody. I, I had very, I was, I was 22, I had very little life experience. I certainly had no experience with police. But these guys look like police. I mean, they carried themselves like police. And uh, sure enough, they were from the AFOSI, the Air Force Office of Special Investigation. Uh, if you've maybe not heard of it, the OSI is to the Air Force as NCIS is to the Navy. It's kind of the investigative branch of their uh, security police. So they, they flashed me badges. One was an older guy, and he was a major, and the other was a younger guy who was a captain. And uh, I guess that the park rangers found that chain down, went up, found Toby's bag, found his address at Whiteman Air Force Base, and called you know, the base commander or somebody and said, you had a couple of your airmen go down, come down here, and it looks like they're planning on coming back because they left all their stuff. Well, that does look suspicious, so I can understand in a way. Um, and he started to interrogate me, and, and he's asking me questions, and I can never answer a question to his satisfaction. And it was uh, you know, very stressful. And this goes on for about 30 minutes. And finally, the nurse comes back in and says, you know, doctor wants him to have this now. And he's like, go ahead, I think we're about done here. So she gives me a shot, and uh, she leaves, and the captain leaves, and it's just me and this major in my hospital room. And the head of my bed is near the door. So he has his hand on the door, one hand on the door, and he bends over next to my face and he whispers. And, and he, had this, he had this Alabama, Louisiana accent. I'm not sure where he was from, but he had this thick accent. And he said, son, I know and you know you two knuckleheads stumbled onto something while you were out there, and I want you to tell me about it. And I didn't know how to answer the guy. I knew I wasn't going to tell him I saw a UFO. And he said, you know, son, I know you know what I'm talking about, and all I want to know is how many pictures of it did you take? And without thinking, I blurted out, sir, I never, I never took a single picture, which is an admission. So when I said that, he just smiled because he got his answer. He knew we saw something. I knew he saw something. We both knew. How he knew, I don't know. I'll never understand. But I've, I really believe that this Air Force major knew what we saw. So I had that reputation as being an amateur photographer. 
I think these guys were concerned that I had a 36 exposure roll of black and white film, pictures of that thing. God, I wish I had, you know, uh, but, I, but I didn't. And, you know, Toby had a camera in his bag a foot from him. And even though I was really, really into photography, the thought of taking a picture never crossed my mind. It never occurred to me to have Toby take out his camera and start taking pictures. I, that thought never crossed my mind. And I've had, I've had people email me who say, you know, I had this sighting, and I email them back, and say, well, did you get any pictures? And they're like, no, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't want to take my eyes off the thing, or it didn't really occur to me to take a picture. Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of interesting. So he left, I went home, and I had 30 days off duty, uh, which I thought was very generous. They sent me home with what I call a bucket of pills. They sent me home with these pills, um, and I was supposed to take three tablets a day for seven days with each meal. And I started taking them, and about the third day, my wife sits down with me and says, I gotta, I gotta talk to you, I wanna tell you something. And she says, you know, I wouldn't lie to you, but she says, I think these pills are making you stupid. <laughs> and she was right. I mean, I didn't balance a checkbook, I'm watching cartoons on TV, you know? <laughs> I'm not myself. And I could see that when she explained it to me, that I wasn't myself. And I, I stopped taking those pills. Well, what was interesting, what was kind of uh, nerve-wracking about it was, the first night that I got home from the hospital, I'm going to take my first pill with dinner that night. And about 7 o'clock p.m., there's a knock on my door. Uh, and I open the door, and here's this nurse. She has no insignia of rank and no name, name tag. She introduces herself as Nurse Janet. And she says, I'm here to do your pill count. Just make sure you've taken your pills. And I said, sure, I, I do as I'm told. And she had a little thing like a pharmacist would use with a blade to count the pills out. She counted the pills out, made a note, never once took my blood pressure, asked how I was feeling, none of that. But she wanted the pill count. So my wife said, here's what we do. You know, hold that, that pill in your mouth if she comes and, uh, you know, wants to see you take a pill. And you can take a sip of water and, you know, and that never happened, luckily. Um, but I was careful to take one pill every time we ate a meal. We ate three a day. I'd take a pill and flush it down the toilet. And I think how different my life might have been had I saved one of those pills. I don't know. Um, and I, my, my thought, I hadn't even ta thought about Toby. I thought, if Toby's taking these pills, he, it, it's going to mess up his life. And even though I wanted nothing to do with the guy, I wanted to pick up the phone and call him and tell him. But I didn't. And about uh, two days after I quit taking the pills, certainly by the third day, I was back to myself. Um, and I wonder if I would have suffered some kind of permanent damage had I continued to take those. And, and why would they give them to me in the first place? What, what was the benefit or what was the idea, you know, the object of the exercise? I don't know. Um, I, had, I had this order over my head that I couldn't see Toby. But I had this feeling that I did want to see him. I wanted to see him one last time. They cut him orders for Japan at light speed. I mean, he PCSed out in a matter of a few weeks and was gone. Um, and that was unusual until I talked to a gentleman named Robert Hastings, who's written a book called UFOs and Nukes. And he's talked probably to more veterans than anybody else on the planet who had experiences like me. And uh, he said, yeah, he says, that's, that's very common. He said, you know, if three people have some, you know, intimate encounter like you guys had, they bust up the group. They'll send one to one side of the world, one to the other. Sure enough, they sent Toby to Japan. So he had orders to, to Japan. I knew he would be leaving soon. And we're coming home from the grocery store. I told my wife, please pull over at Toby's house. He's two blocks from our house. I just want to run in and wish the guy well. 
I thought doing that would give me some kind of closure. Um, so she stopped. She was reluctant to do that. She said, Terry, these OSI people scare me. I said, I know, they scare me too. But I just felt like I had a responsibility to shake his hand, say, nice working with you, good luck in Japan, adios, bye. And I thought that that would buy me, um, buy me some kind of peace. And, and I, I will admit that both of us had difficulty processing this event that we went through. I had terrible trouble sleeping at night, and, and still do. You know, I'm 68 years old, I sleep with a light on. Uh, the closet door's got to be closed. Uh, I have a ritual that I go through, you know, to make sure nobody's in the house, and the alarm is set, and I do that every night. And I don't think uh, I'm the only one. So my wife stops, I ran up to Toby's door, and I did what I'd done a hundred times before, and that is I knocked once real loud, and I opened the door, and I said, hey guys, it's me. And I stepped inside, and his wife, Tammy, was walking across, I was in like kind of vestibule front of the house, walked past me, and she turned at me and gave me a dirty look and said, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, I know, but I just wanted to wish you guys well, you know, wish you good luck in Japan, have fun. Um, and Toby heard our exchange, and he came from down the hallway, he came around the corner, and he was a mess. Uh, his hair was all wonky, uh, he was wearing a dirty t-shirt, dirty jeans, he was barefoot. Now granted, I gotta cut him some slack, he's moving, and that is dirty business. Um, but I knew Toby to be meticulous about his appearance. You know, he always looked good, he always, um, he liked nice clothes, and he always, you know, it was, it was out of character for him to look like this. And when I saw him, I, I just felt stunned for some reason. And he walks up to me, and uh, I stuck out my hand the same time he stuck out his hand, and we kind of missed, and then we managed this inelegant kind of handshake. And he was a shorter guy than I am, by about two or three inches. And he looked up at me, and there's tears in his eyes. And his eyes are bloodshot, and I could smell liquor on his breath. Now, Toby was not a drinker. I mean, if we went to a barbecue where we're playing cards or something, he might have a can of beer. You know, if he had a second, you know, you'd throw it on the chicken on the barbecue or something. He was not a drinker. So that kind of shocked me. And I didn't ask him about it. But I said, I understand you're going to Japan. I just wanted to wish you guys well. And he looked up and he said, it happened, didn't it, Terry? And I said, yes, my brother, it really happened. And he said, but why us? And I said, I ain't got a clue. I have no idea. And I felt panicked. And I, I ran to the car, and uh, what I thought would buy me some peace, it didn't work out that way. It just bought me a lot of anxiety. So, um, so Toby PCSed out to Japan, and I notice we're at 10.35, if my watch is anywhere close to right. I wanted to save some time uh, for you guys to ask a questions, because uh, I, I know you've got to have a ton of questions, and uh, I like to call this Ask Me Anything, Nothing's Out of Bounds, um, so I'm not sure how we can do that. Uh, I think uh, Forrest is going to help us out here. So if anybody... Thank you. Thank you very much. What did the inside of the uh, ship look like? You oh, never got great to that. question. <laughs> I woke up. I, I went to sleep in the tent. I woke up. I opened my eyes. I was standing, and I couldn't move anything but my eyes. I could rotate my eyes around 360 degrees, and the inside of the ship was all stainless steel, gray, or, or white. And there were a ton of these little gray guys running all over the place. And I, ha I have a theory about them, and this is just an assumption. I think these little guys are manufactured 
I don't think they're living, sentient beings like you and I are. I think they come off a production line. Um, I, I did see on my left, straining my eyes as far to the left as I could, there was a row of uh, what looked like garage doors, and there were, were saucers in front of them. And uh, I saw what looked like a golf cart full of these gray guys that had no wheels, that was just zooming around. And the inside of this place, and I don't know, maybe they took us someplace else, but the inside of this place did not match size-wise to what we saw. What I saw looked the size of a Walmart. The thing we were in was as big as an NFL stadium. So I don't know how that works. Um, but in a nutshell, that's, that's what we saw. Oh, we did see some other human beings that were aboard the ship. That were, they were segregated off to our right. So we weren't with them, and they were all situated like we were. We had our hand, clothing in our hands, just like they did. But this was a mixed bag of men, women, and children. This wasn't men. Uh, and they're all, their eyes are rolling all over the place, and they're all crying. And I don't know how long they'd been standing there. I don't know what happened to them. That bugs me to this day. But uh, that's, that's what I saw inside. Real quick, not sure. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hello, thank you for coming. And did you ever contact or have any interaction with Toby since? Did he, Toby ever read your book? Did you ever get back together? Long story, and I'll try to condense it. I still wanted nothing to do with Toby. I separated from the Air Force in 1979, October 25th, 1979. And you know, went to finish my undergraduate degree. And I'm going to school, and I'm thinking, I wouldn't mind seeing him again. So I had a phone number that supposedly was his dad's house in Flint. And I called up, and I said, can I talk to Toby? And he said, well, Toby doesn't live here, but he does stay here sometimes. And I got the impression he was maybe homeless. Um, so the next time I called back, six, he said he, I left my number. He said he'd have him call me. And six months later, it, it's around Christmas time, I try calling him again, and the number's disconnected. Now, there's a longer story I don't have time to go into, but I'd ask, uh, I, I got to know, when I was working and started my legal career, I got to know this FBI agent. And I asked him to help me out. Can you help me find my buddy? And he said, well, you know, I can't open an official investigation, but I'll see what I can do for you. And he told me, he said, write down absolutely everything that you know you can remember about the guy, you know, height, weight, color, where he went to high school, what his wife's name was, you know, everything you can think of factually and put it on a piece of paper. And I did that, and I went to his office with a sealed envelope with his name on it, delivered it, and uh, about three weeks passed, and then... We met at this pub we'd sometimes go to on Friday nights and have a beer after, at the end of the week. And uh, I got there before he did. He walked in. I could tell he didn't have good news because he, he had that look like it's going to be bad news. And uh, he sat down and I said, well, where's my friend? And he said, Terry, I got bad news for you. Your friend is dead. And he said it was a head-on car accident on 94 between here and Chicago, or part, between here and uh, Detroit. And it happened about a year ago, and, and I'm very sorry. But he said, Terry, you know, you've been around the block once or twice. You know this happens. This is just life. It happens. He said, my suggestion is you suck it up and go on with your life. Now, I could have easily picked up the phone and called the uh, uh, Michigan State Police headquarters over by Michigan State University and asked them, I'm looking for my friend, I understand he died in an automobile accident, I want a copy of the police report, but I didn't do any of that. I didn't bother to do any of that. Well, to make a long story short, through a bunch of different channels, I found out that Toby was alive until September 4, 2007. And that's the date that he passed. So we had these decades between us where we could have been sitting around at a barbecue and debriefing one another like we never had the chance to do. And you know, I, I, I regret that. Thank you. Um, 
We spoke the other day. I dropped by and saw you down in your booth. <clears throat> I <clears throat> used to do some rock climbing. We would go to Devil's Den. And after I read your initial story a few years ago, I told my buddies that when you used to go there, I said, I'm never going back there again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Uh, my questions, I had two little quick ones here. One, uh, when you watched the grays from the tent, um, did they appear to be a certain height, and did they have clothes or shoes, something like that on? They all appeared to be identical in height and mannerisms and everything. I couldn't tell if it was a separate garment or it was somehow molded to their body. If it was, if it was a garment of some time, it was tight-fitting. Uh, it was gray in color that matched their skin tone, and they had on you know, boots that were incorporated into their, their trousers some way. But they were all dressed absolutely identical. About what distance do you estimate that you were actually from the tent to where they were? Probably, probably 300 feet, maybe less. We were a fair distance away, but they were close enough we could see them uh, when the points of this triangle would flash. So I could see well enough to know what I saw. Last, last, last real quick question. Did you ever see the, uh, the people that, the three people that interrogated you again, ever? No, never. None of them, ever. Thank you. Hi, Terry. Thank you for that. It was great. Thank I have you. a quick question. Do you feel that after this contact in 1977, you have um, still a connection to whatever beings you interacted with or that you saw? You know, I, I do. And I wish I had an hour and a half to go into that, and I would tell you all about it. But... I just, I refer to them as non-human entities because I think that's the best description for me. And I had an incident of missing time back in 1987 on a motorcycle ride. Um, at that event, my, my, I had missing time. Um, my wife woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't in bed, and she saw a silhouetted three-foot figure at the edge of the bed, silhouetted against the window, and this thing spoke to her telepathically and said, everything's fine, go back to sleep. And that's what she did. And that is her one and only experience with the stuff that she ever had. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. That's a very excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, my question has to do, how did this, does this relate to near-death experience? That, re that you have in the, your last book? You know, no, the, the third book that I published is called Free Fall, An American Near-Death Experience. And it has absolutely nothing to do with aliens or UFOs. I'll tell you how it happened. I, you know, I had this email address in the back of my book, and one of these 4,200 emails I received, uh, and again, I, I keep things on a, on a spreadsheet. Out of 4,200 people, I had exactly four people who had near-death experiences. And wanted that, that they said, here's my experience, and they wanted to know if I saw a correlation, a, a parallel between a near-death experience and contact with non-human entities. And at first, I'm like, huh? You know, no. Uh, but the more I thought about it, I thought about the subject of consciousness and other places and her story. There, it's actually a compilation of two stories. They're both medical doctors. Uh, one drowned, and she's kind of like the central figure of the story, but her story impressed me so much, I said, I want to tell your story. Uh, and I wanted her to join me as a co-author, but she was afraid it would cause her problems at work. Um, and I, I, I wrote the book, and uh, this was all new territory for me. I didn't know anything about the near-death experience. But I was, I was blown away. The more I found out, the more blown away I was. I guess we'll learn more when we read the book. So, thank you. Thank you.